Oh yeah, baby. I told you guys it was going to be something special. 3,000 subscribers. 3,000 amazing hackers that have chosen to subscribe to me. That is insane, guys. Thank you so much. And to thank you for this, I've done something special for you. I've updated my bug bounty methodology to version 2. There's going to be some more tips in there for you guys. There's going to be a general strategy. And let's get away with that silly stuff right now because we're going to get down to business, shall we? So thank you very much for that. There's going to be some other videos uh, still related to 3000 subscribers because we're also hitting 3K on Twitter soon. Let's get right into the video, shall we? The first thing I want to tell you guys is, of course, you're going to need a general strategy for when you're attacking a target. So first of all, you really need to get to know your application. So when you pick your target, you go to integrity, you, lo you look through the programs or HackerOne or uh, Buckroad or any other big platform or small platform. You pick your program. First of all, get to know it a little bit. So it's really important that you have, that you get to know your application, that you really are interested in what you're going to test. So say, for example, you really like this, uh, you really like computer stuff and there's a program on integrity called hardware.info and they report on all of this uh, hardware and they give you info about it. That's pretty obvious, but that's really something that might be interesting to you. So you know you'll spend more time on that website. You know you'll find it easier to test. So pick a target that you actually enjoy. Pick a target that sounds interesting to you. And then actually get to know the application a little bit. Keep burp open in the background while you do that. So you capture all of your requests and you do some passive scanning. Uh, and then you start with cross-site scripting and SSTI as early as possible. If they are in scope, that is, of course, uh, SSDI is normally usually in scope, cross-site scripting might not always be, but if they are, insert those factors into every single field that you can. I'm going to give you guys some more specific tips for each type of cross-site scripting and also for SSDI later on. But when you register an, an account, do it in the name field, do it in the address field, do it, try it wherever, see which one gives an error. And if you get an error, correct that field, but whichever one doesn't give an error, have your cross-site scripting and tag factor in there and also an SSDI and whatever you want to fuss, have them in the fields where it's possible. Now, the next tip is related to that. You really got to create your own fuzzing lists. For all of these types of attacks, there are going to be some, some type of fuzzing. And it's really important that you have your own fuzzing list. Expand the list as you find more. So if you find a vulnerability uh, manually, you can add it to your list uh, and you can try fuzzing for it on other endpoints and other programs. Regularly go over your programs again after you've already tested them. Uh, and VDP overpaid if you want less competition. That's really important because if you really want to get started, I highly recommend that you do uh, your, your programs that give you points, your vulnerability disclosure programs, because of course there are going to be a lot less hackers on there. A lot of the hackers want to go for the money. Uh, so you're going to have a chance to get those private invites, which again are going to have less hackers on them. Overall, it will lead to a little bit less frustration if you ask me. Now, a really important tip I have for you guys is POC or get the fuck out. Um, if you cannot prove impact of your vulnerability, don't even bother reporting it. Prove some impact. Uh, say you find like a self cross site scripting, there is no impact to a self cross site scripting. So don't report it, it's useless, you know. Unless you can chain it into something like CSRF into self cross site scripting. That might be something, but then again, show impact of your cross-site scripting. Try to steal a cookie, try to execute a JavaScript function, you know. Uh, there are many different things that you can do, but make sure that you show some kind of impact from your vulnerabilities. As for sessions, uh, it's really, I could have named this broken access control as well, but make user with every role and check if he can directly access pages he should not be able to. What do I mean by this? Say for example, you have a module called invoices. You should make a user that does not have access to invoices and you should log in as that user and go to the invoices. See if you can access it, but also execute any backend calls related to invoices and see if you can get any of those. 
say for example you're not able to directly go to the invoices in the ui but there might be an endpoint that prints the invoice pdf and you might be able to print that invoice that contains customer details so that might be an option for an IDOR that's a little bit deeper. Um, I think it would qualify like as a second order IDOR, but I'm not 100% sure. Now, uh, what's also possible is if you have uh, if you have like a user, you can try to take away a role and you can see if that user can still do that action before logging out. Now, um, most programs uh, will not accept this as a vulnerability because they just refresh the session each time you log in again so uh, each time you log in you get checked what rights you have and not each action you do but some programs might find this a vulnerability be careful with this though really read your in and out of scope carefully because some uh, companies don't like these types of vulnerabilities also at the session tokens if the session token doesn't change you might be able to use it for session fixation um, if you get an account takeover by stealing a session token you might may be able to make it last forever just keep using the same session token um, so there are some vulnerabilities in there as well you can see if you can guess the session token there is a, a tab in burp called sequencer I'll make a video about that later as well. You enter a few values and Burp is going to try to guess some valid ones for you. Um, what you can also do is delete a locked in user and see if you can still do some actions. Um, all again, same as the previous one, when you take away a role, some companies might not accept it because they might have that session stored and they might use it for as long as they want to. So be really careful with these two, but uh, make sure that you try to test for broken access control as well. That's something that not a lot of testers will do, but if your uh, application, if your target has like a module for rights regulation, try to play a little bit with those rights, you know. Um, if you have the option to see all invoices or only your own invoices, again, try to set it to only your own invoices and try to go to other invoices as well. A really good tip for you guys there not all programs will like this and not all programs are suitable for this that's also really important that you know that because this only works if you have access to those uh, modules but if you do it might be something that's really good and not all targets again will accept this make sure that personal identifiable information is involved because that of course makes it instantly like a valid bug if you're not supposed to be able to see somebody's personal identifiable information but you are able to see it that of course is probably going to be a vulnerability now on to stored cross-site scripting for you guys again for every input field that you see just try to get like this entity in here an html entity uh, try to get an obfuscated entity in there like um, try to do this url encoded try to replace these with html entities um, if any of these catch, like if you actually see a link on the page, you should go, try and go deeper, like um, try and insert an image, try and insert an image with an error, and try and insert an image with an on error event handler. So I also have a video for you uh, uh, for this one. I also mentioned this in my previous video for the methodology, so I'm not going to go too deep into it. For the reflect cross-site scripting, I haven't changed anything either. Just check the error pages as well. Uh, try getting every reflected parameter. Um, try getting endpoints that you normally wouldn't see very easily from the JavaScript and try and see if there are reflected values there. Burp Pro is going to indicate when it sees the reflected value. If you don't have Burp Pro, you're going to have to pay attention. I don't know if any of you guys know any tools for finding reflected cross-site scripting. I know there's XSS Hunter, uh, sorry, not XSS Hunter. There is a tool, uh, I'm not familiar with 100% because I don't really like automation for cross-site scripting, but of course, feel free to use it. Again, some videos for you guys. As for DOM XSS, one big tip for you guys, would not recommend doing it manually. I've included a tool for you guys there for Burp Pro Scanner. It can automatically find it and a free tool raw to DOM XSS scanner. Now this is a new section as for blind cross-site scripting. <coughs> I always recommend people use cross-site scripting hunter. 
Um, what it is, is it's just like a website where you can go and register. In fact, we can go there now quickly, XSS Hunter. There we go. Uh, and what it allows you to do, by the way, these hidden fields are from Burp. Um, so what XSS Hunter allows you to do is it allows you to add a few of your attack factors so you can register for XSS Hunter. If you register, you get some um, you get some attack factors that you can just copy and paste into your target. And if one of them fires, XSS Hunter is going to tell you about it. It's going to send you a mail and a notification, and it's going to tell you where your payload fired from. Now, why is this useful? Because say, for example, you have um, a customer contact form and in that customer contact form, you fill in these payloads, but you never, you're never able to get the backend to show the customer contact feedback that you support, that you've submitted. Somebody else in the backend is going to open it and it might be a different system. It might not be, but somebody is going to open it. And when they see that payload, it might fire. And that's what we call blind XSS because you insert your payload, but you have no idea about the results. Now um, start hunting for blind XSS as soon as possible again. Copy every payload from your XSS Hunter section and paste it into every field that you see. Uh, what's also useful to know is that XSS Hunter contains a payload for CSP bypass and you can generate some variations of your payload. Now it doesn't show here properly, but I uh, replaced this less than sign with n less than point comma. That's the HTML entity. So generate some of your own variations. And this is important for your fuzzing list. Again, create your own fuzzing list, create your own variations of this. Uh, XSS filter evasions, I haven't changed a whole lot. Again, the same thing here happened with the less than and greater than signs. Um, you can also try some polyglots. For command injection, this is a new section. Um, I have some tips for you. Again, create your own fuzzing lists. Um, look at the videos for that. One of the videos goes pretty much into detail about what you have to do for that. There is a really cool uh, web Port Swigger Web Academy uh, security list that will give you like which commands you can use and which separators you can use. You should make your own fuzzing list based on that. Again, check the videos for that. Blind command injection can happen. So make sure you uh, include like a delay command, like a wait or uh, some ping to itself, like a ping 127001. Um, minus C10 that will give you like some delay so you know that if your page responds a lot slower than actually is expected of the page then you know that you might have a command injection and you should investigate further make sure you also include your Windows and Linux commands on your fuzzing lists really important because you never know 100% what backend you're talking to if you do of course use a separate list use only the Linux or the Windows commands but if you're not sure, use both. As for CSRF, uh, this one hasn't changed. Check if there's a CSRF token, check if the token changes, check if the token is still accepted, if it's randomly changed. As for cookies, haven't changed anything here either. These are just some flags that you need to check and if the domain is checked. Also, is the cookie reflected somewhere in the URL get parameter that might make it vulnerable to a man in the middle attack. As for IDOs and broken access controls, I haven't had, uh, I haven't added a whole lot, just one thing. And that's that in Europe, personal identifiable information is pretty sensitive. So if you find a bug containing any PII, make sure that you report it because it can have a higher severity because of that. Now, the next thing I added in, in here is LFI RFI. Some tips for you guys. If a file or image is being loaded from your local disk, try LFI RFI. So say if you have a parameter file equals test.jpg, try LFI RFI of course, and also keep your VPS handy for when you need to do RFI. Because when you need to do RFI, you don't want to be messing with firewalls and putting ports open and a DMZ on your home network and all that kind of stuff. You just want to have a server in the cloud that you can fire up and test on. So. Again, keep a VPS handy. There are some really cheap options. I'll put uh, I put a refer uh, I'll put a link in the description below that you guys can go to. Um, it's an affiliate code for Linode, and then of course also SSTI. SSTI is something I'm not super familiar with, but I included some uh, some injection strings, some fuzzing strings here for you guys, and also some videos. 
I would highly recommend that you do your own research on SSTI because it's an emerging topic and it's very in-depth. So there hasn't been a whole lot of research done into SSTI. There has been some, of course, but there is a lot more to discover. So if you guys are into doing your own research and discovering stuff like this, SSTI would be an amazing topic for you. As for XXC, uh, some tips I have for you guys, by the way, this is also a new section. For every XML input that you see, try XXC, of course. And for every document upload, say, for example, you can upload your resume. And if you uh, open that resume, it opens inside of the web page. Try a docx file, um, try an xlsx file, try any uh, file that has some kind of X XML into it. Because like, if you uh, look at the file structure of a docx file, it's basically just a couple of XML files that are compiled into one file that make a document. So uh, XXC is of course possible there as well. And for every picture you upload, try an SVG. Those can contain XXCs as well. I've included some videos for you guys again. One of them is going to be about the SVG XXC and that's a highly recommended one. Now onto SSRF, I have some videos for you guys on that topic. I'm not an expert on that as well, so they're going to be pretty basic, but you should always try to look for SSRF, of course. As for chaining cross-site scripting, uh, maybe you can use cross-site scripting to steal a non-HTTP only cookie. Or maybe you can use it to override the cookie on a different path. Maybe you can use a session that never changes with cross-site scripting to steal the session cookie for eternal takeover. These are some tips for you guys that you can use. Uh, of course, when you're hunting, you may have remembered these from the last video. Uh, they haven't changed a whole lot. And again, some videos for you guys there. Now, uh, CSRF into cross-site scripting for self-XSS. I also gave you guys that tip before. As for chaining IDOR, some programs use UUIDs, which are these really long strings. And you might find an IDOR, IDOR on that UUID. It will be low impact because it's really hard to guess this UUID and you cannot brute force it either because it's so long and it's going to take ages. Um, but maybe you can find an endpoint that lists all of those UUIDs and that might help raise your severity again. Now again, be really mindful of the program. Some programs don't appreciate this uh, type of bug and that's okay, you know, just move on to a different program then if this is your type of bug. Uh, finding hidden endpoints, some new tips for you guys there. Read the documentation. If there's an API, there might be API documentations as well, so try to Google for them. Um, I found a couple of API documentations that have really opened my eyes to some hidden endpoints. And I would really advise you guys to do the same because it might be some interesting uh, things for your target in there. Now, of course, if it's like a public program, like uh, I'm going to just name a name, Kinepolis, which is like the big cinema complex here in Belgium, they're of course not going to have API documentation. Well, maybe they do, you never know, of course, they, because they also have like external suppliers that are going to have to integrate with APIs. So maybe you can find some some API documentation doing OSINT, you know, y your Google foo is stronger than mine. Go Google, you know, <laughs> it's awesome that we have this tool. Now, also, if there's a mobile app, but that mobile application is not in scope, the app might still communicate with a server or an API. So it's really important that you guys think outside of the box on this one. Um, you can, of course, download the mobile application there's nothing wrong with downloading the application even if it's not in scope you can set up your whole proxy you can set up burp and you can catch all of the requests and if the api that the requests are going to is in scope bam you suddenly have like a whole new uh, expansion of uh, attack surface so that might be really interesting uh, gao is like a really great tool to analyze javascript files it extract like all of the URLs from there. So if you are interested in that, I should put a link in here. Look in the settings if you can find some modules that are not active by default. That's also a really interesting one because not a lot of hackers take this hurdle and every hurdle that you take leaves a few other hackers behind you. Like say, for example, if you're testing a target and it has a, by default, it has an invoices module and an orders module and a work orders module. But there might also be a module for um, ticket sales. 
So that ticket sales module might not be active by default. You might be able to activate it yourself. If you're not, try to contact the platform that you're hunting on. Say, for example, you're hunting on Integrity and you really want to have that one module activated, contact support. They might be able to help you with it. They will not always be able to help you with it, but some targets do offer those premium features to be tested. If there is a paywall that you see for yourself, uh, you can, of course, contact uh, your, your target. You can, I mean, contact your platform ask if the target offers like uh, test accounts for those paid features. But if they do not, you should probably try to invest in it. If you really like your target, it always pays off to unlock those paywalled features because they give you like a whole new attack surface again. And again, not a lot of hackers are going to even bother trying to look at it. And the more access you have, the better. So this was my updated testing checklist. I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, you can always buy me a block of cheese. It's in the description below. You can always support me on Patreon. Patreons, any Patreon of any tier gets like a free 15 minute phone call with the rat every single month. So thank you very much to everybody who supports the channel, both financially by buying merch, by just buying these coaching sessions by viewing the channel, by liking my videos, by sharing them on Twitter, on Instagram, everything. You guys are amazing. Thank you guys so much. We have reached 3000 subscribers, which is something I would thought I would never reach. Honestly, this is amazing to me. I'm stunned. Um, I've been invited to like uh, this Discord group with some big YouTubers and I'm amazed because I love being in this space. The community is so cool and it's like Stuck says, you know, Stuck is like a big content creator. If you guys don't know him, go check him out. He's like positive vibes only and that's what I get from this community, you know. Even if you have like a negative day, you can even post it and people will be like, hey, it's going to be okay, don't worry, man. And that's what I love so much about this community, guys. The red pack is amazing. I love you guys to death and I hope I'll see you in the next one. If you enjoyed this one, I would really appreciate the like. See you later, guys. Peace.